my great aunt Maureen, Ben, and my grandmother, Gertie, is the first ever photo taken of Ben as Prime Minister. It's taken in the home at Russell Street, just up around the corner from him. The family home in Mother Russell Street is where you would find all the chips. The home was the centre of the family. It was the first stop when Ben came back to Bathurst. Ben's visit to Bathurst was unannounced and to the dismay of the Bathurst Mayor, Alderman Alan Morse, who at the time was planning a mayoral reception for Ben, but Ben wanted to keep the visit low key to spend time with his family. He knew the responsibilities he now faced loomed large. Ben's family, like many in Australia, was touched by war. The loss in the European theatre of the beloved cousin, pilot officer Walter Edward Atkinson of the Royal Australian Air Force, 456 Squadron, a Bathurst boy who flew at D-Day. It was this tragedy that made Ben's address to the nation on the 15th of August, 1945, via Radio 2CY Canberra at 9.30am to announce the end of the war in the Pacific, the surrender of the Japanese, and to glare the end of World War II, more poignant, one month after becoming Prime Minister. So this is a photo of the family of Ben sitting to give that announcement. I'm now going to play the Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia, Mr. David Chipley. Fellow citizens, the war is over. The Japanese government has accepted the terms of surrender imposed by the Allied nations and hostilities will now cease. The reply by the Japanese government to the note sent by Britain, the United Nations, the US, SR and China has been received and accepted by the Allied Nations. At this moment, let us offer thanks to God. Let us remember those whose lives were given that we may enjoy this glorious moment and may look forward to a peace which they have won for us. Let us remember those whose thought with proud sorrow turned towards gallant loved ones who will not come back. On behalf of the people and the government of Australia, I offer humble thanks to the fighting men of the United Nations whose gallantry, sacrifice and devotion to duty have brought us the victory. Nothing can fully repay the debt we owe them while can history record in adequate terms their deeds from the black days that followed September 1939 and December 1941 until this month. We owe too a great debt to those men and women who performed the miracles of production in secondary and primary industries so that the battle of supply could be won and a massive effort achieved. Materials, money and resources have been poured out so that the fighting men would not go short. Australia's part comparatively in terms of fighting forces and supply ranks high and the Australian people may be justly proud of everything they have done. I am sure that you would like me to convey to the commanders of the fighting forces the warmest thanks for their skill, efficiency and great devotion. Especially do I mention General Douglas MacArthur, with whom we had so much in common and with whom we shared the dangers when Australia was threatened with invasion. In your name, I offer to the leaders of the United Nations our congratulations and thanks. We join with the United States in a common regret that that inspiring leader, the late Mr. Roosevelt, did not live to see this day. We thank his successor, President Truman, 
for the work he has done. The Australians too will feel their happiness tinged with sorrow that another man who gave his all was not spared to be with us to die. That man was John Kirk. To Mr. Churchill, General SMO Stalin, and General SMO Kaim Kaishek, go the unstinted thanks of free people everywhere for what they have done for the common cause. Especially to the honour Mr. Churchill, with whom in the dark days, to use his own words, we had the honour to stand alone against aggression. And now our men and women will come home. Our fighting men will battle on the stick upon them from every theatre of war. Whilst Graydon stopped the Japanese in their drive south, just as they helped start the first march toward other victory in North Africa. Australians fought in the battles of the air everywhere, and Australian seamen covered every ocean. They are coming home to a peace which has to be won, the United Nations Charter, or a war world organisation is the hope of the world. And Australia has pledged the same activity in making it successful as she showed in the framing of it. Here in Australia there is much to be done. The Australian government, which stood steadfast during the dread days of the war, will give all that it has to working and planning to ensure that the peace will be a real thing. I ask that the state governments and all sections of the community should cooperate in facing the tasks and solving the problems that are ahead. Let us join together in the march of our nation to future greatness. You are aware of what has been arranged for the celebration of this great victory and deliverance. In the name of the Commonwealth Government, I invite you to join in the Thanksgiving services at Rain, for clearly this is a time to give thanks to God and to those men and so sacrifice for us there is no comparison. Good day to you, fellow citizens. So that was the announcement that was given on the 15th of August, 1945, at 9.30 in the morning. It is worth noting that prior to that, then and the government gazetted a public holiday prior to that announcement. So now we walk into 1946, the uncle, the leader, and of course the election. Family was important to Ben, and Mary Burdett Chipley, or Bertie, my grandmother, was the eldest daughter of Richard and of Richard. Ben's younger brother. Bertie would travel regularly with her uncle and Auntie Liz and stay with them in the Prime Minister's Lodge. And this is a picture of my grandmother. This was taken in 1946 in the study at the Prime Minister's Lodge. During her time in Canberra, Bertie would pen letters home giving a unique account of life with her uncle Ben as Prime Minister. Accounts of life as a, at the Prime Minister's Lodge with Ben and Elizabeth and her role as Ben's representative, playing ladies, going to tea fights and everyday life with the family. So again, this is my, my grandmother and Elizabeth at the Lodge and this would have to be one of my favourite photos because of the car. <laughs> um, this is the 1939 Buick Limousine C1 Commonwealth number one car. Um, you have my grandmother left to right, Bertie. I'm not sure who the lady is there. Then you have Elizabeth Clark, who was uh, Isabel Clark, who was Elizabeth's companion, and then you have Elizabeth. These were taken in 1946. On the 24th of March. Bertie boarded the Duke of Gloucester's aircraft from Bathurst Airport with her uncle Ben and Annie used to travel to Canberra. During the time spent in Canberra, Bertie penned an account of her visit. I'm going to actually play a recording of that letter and the events of that letter took place between 
24th of March and the 1st of April. 1st of April, 1946. As you can see by this, I started it at the lodge. I had tucked myself into Uncle's study with a nice fire and was going to work a lovely long letter. But no, other people had other ideas. And so I was dragged out to a picture review that was for the Louis Mountbatten's. And I never had another chance to even do that much from then on. The Louis Mountbatten's arrived just before we did. Their plaque was being taken off the runway as we came in. Yes, I went over with Uncle and his boy playing. It was a thrill. We did it in less than an hour. Yours truly was up front with the crew all the way. They were very nice to me and told me all about everything. What it was for, how it worked. There were one or two gadgets too. The Duke's crew met us. They are a right nice sort of men and we'll probably be going with Uncle on his next trip. There is no rest for the wicked in that place called Canberra. If one is not going to a tea fight, they haven't won themselves. Or going to some silly turnout where everyone shakes everyone else's hand until it's a wonder one has an arm left. One day Uncle counted that he had shaken the Duke's hand ten times in a day. Ain't it silly? The times I enjoyed myself the most was the mornings when Uncle and I had breakfast together, as everyone else was in bed. Then I would walk to Parliament House with him and leave the sweepers, and go down to the cellars under the place with an old chap who knew all there was to know about it. There are some wonderful things down here with us. Then, of a night after dinner, we would go, go away from everyone and have coffee and a cigarette in the study. Went into the house of an afternoon for an hour. Gosh, I was proud of my uncle. I can't humble him, and he's not a bit well. Here's a little advice. If you are ever asked to go to an Indian dinner, don't, unless you want to have an Ibibus tap. I went to the Indian legation and had dinner with the minister's daughters. At first it was quite discerning. One sits around and looks silly, more than usual, I mean, and drink sweet wines. And because my name is Bertie, I am my cousin friends of a parrot, whose name is nobody's business and who sits on my shoulder. By the way, Miss P, I can't spell it, is really a nice person and she speaks beautiful English. I really like her very much and I think she likes me a bit too. Well, after everyone drinks as much wine as they can and gets used to the smell of some incense that is burned in their honour, we proceed to what should be the dining room. The table is lovely, lace mats on a beautiful polished black table with a little bouquet of roses in front of you. The first course is served in cut glass dishes. It is shrimp in a kind of pink sauce, which is not too bad. But that is just to deceive. One, or when it is finished, a big tray is put in front of you. What is on it is hard to tell. It seems like a concoction with a capital C of rice and vegetable, done in chilies, curry, and cayenne pepper. I looked one, and I looked at it, and thought, well, here it goes. The quicker it's over, the better. But one has to do one's duty and stay with it. Now that was a great mistake, for as soon as you finish, they fill it up again. And so it goes until Miss P gives someone at the back of you, who you never see in more than a hand which comes over your shoulder ever so often, a nod. This concoction, which came very close to looking like soup, is eaten by Miss P with her fingers. And believe it or not, she never got it on her chin, not once. They evidently don't believe in washing up. Or well, you wipe up the tray with what she called bubble bit. Birdie. That was my grandmother. In Birdie's 
letters, she mentions two significant occasions that took place. First, the arrival of the Supreme Allied Commander of Southeast Asia, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten and Lady Mountbatten, and the second is the upcoming trip overseas, Ben's first trip as Prime Minister. This slide is an of the samurai swords being presented to Ben. Lord and Louis Mountbatten arrived in Canberra from Singapore on the 24th of March, 1946, for a seven day visit to Australia at the invitation of the Commonwealth Government. The aircraft touched down at exactly 9am. The following day, Lord Louis Mountbatten attended a luncheon with Ben and Cabinet Ministers at Parliament House. During the luncheon, two samurai swords were presented. The first to the Governor General, the Duke of Gloucester, and the second to Ben. Both samurai swords were surrendered to Louis, Lord Louis Mountbatten by Japanese commanders. The sword being presented to Ben, which is this one here, was carried through the Burma campaign by Japanese regimental officers who were disarmed in Malaya. When the samurai sword was presented to Ben, a senior minister commented, you can cut taxes with that, Ben. The sword is now on display at Chifley Home Education Centre. On the 13th of April, Ben left Bathurst to travel to Sydney to commence a five-week overseas trip to England to meet the British Prime Minister, Mr Attlee, and the Domain Prime Ministers. Then on to US to meet with President Harry Truman and finally on to Japan to visit the Australian troops. Before leaving Bathurst, Ben attended a meeting at the Abercrombie Shire Council. Even as Prime Minister, he rarely missed these meetings. Needing to travel to Sydney, Ben asked the President the President Councillor, the President, Councillor Beswick, and Deputy President, Councillor Brownlow, permission to leave the meeting early, to leave the meeting early. Ben was excused with wishes for a successful trip and a safe return. Ben was glad that this was his last public appearance before leaving Australia, reflecting that there is an air of tranquility and rest here that works wonders on the nerves that becomes frayed through public life. Ben's choice of hotel while in London was the Savoy. On this particular trip, Ben became the centre of a crisis, a crisis he was totally unaware of. On the morning of the 19th of April, Ben cut his finger with a blade from a razor. Now, wanting to get the finger bandaged and not wanting to go to hospital, Ben wandered out of the Savoy onto the Strand to look for a chemist to bandage up the finger. However, this was not the crisis Ben was the centre of. Ben had left the Savoy without his Scotland Yard special branch detective who was meant to know where he was. When the detective arrived later that morning to check on Ben, he discovered he was missing. The crisis was that Scotland Yard had no idea where Ben was. And to the horror of Scotland Yard, they had lost the Prime Minister of Australia and he was wandering around unprotected. Now, being unaware of the crisis, Ben decided that after visiting the chemist, he would take an extended stroll through Kew Gardens and the Embankment Gardens to relax and enjoy the flowers and chatting to whoever wanted to listen. Returning to the Savoy later that morning to the relief of Scotland Yard. Ben wasn't worried about wandering unprotected. As he reflected, no one had recognised him. Later that day, Ben went to Charing Cross Hospital with his Scotland Yard special branch detective to have the offending finger bandage. Now, this is a picture of Ben from that visit to London. 
and it's answered by the 25th of April. At that service, he laid a wreath at the cenotaph. If you look very carefully on the hand, there is a bandaged little finger, the finger that caused the crisis. On leaving London, Ben went to work at Washington. Now, Ben's uh, trip to Washington was very quick and left an impression on the American press, although getting off to a rather bad, on a bad foot by keeping the press half an hour waiting. Overall, the impression was that Ben gave direct and colourless replies. Most of the press expressed the view that Ben was a shrewd guy who couldn't be talked into any answers. Ben met with an interview with President Truman on the 9th of May to discuss Pacific Defence and the appoint appointment of an ambassador to, of, of, from the United States to Australia. Now that position had been left vacant for over a year. Being a quick visit of only a few days. Ben left on the 9th to go to Tokyo for a two day visit to check the welfare of the Australian troops of the British Commonwealth Occupation Forces. And this is a photo taken with Ben having what looks like lunch with the um, Occupation Forces. And these forces were in Japan because of the Commonwealth's wanting to help with the reconstruction after the atomic bomb. So they were mainly in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Ben's first overseas trip as Prime Minister gave an opportunity to reinforce the relationships which were forged through war and to build new ones. Giving Australia's place amongst the nations of the world and emerging from the, first from the depression and then second from the war as an exciting new country. But, one of the, one, but on returning, one of Ben's first big challenges and that of the Chifley government was to come in September with the federal election. And I'm about to play one of the election ALP um, as Israel's. With hostilities over, Australia emerges from the fury of a storm that engulfed mightier and less fortunate nations. Just as sea lanes must be cleared of minefields for the ships of peace, so must the way be cleared for Australia's ship of state to sail safely on. At the helm of that ship today is the man who more than any other, except his predecessor and friend John Curtin, helped Australia to weather the storms of war and the aftermath of war, J.B. Chipley. Here at Canberra, he steers Australia clear from the rocks and shoals of disastrous inflation. Here, after reducing taxation by over 37 million pounds in a few short months, he uttered these vital words, I will not involve this country in the perils of inflation. From the United States itself comes dramatic proof of the wisdom of these words. No Prime Minister, except John Curtin, ever faced such stupendous task as confronted J.B. Chifley. Chief among these was the mobilization and rehabilitation of the men and women of the fighting services. Chifley believes that as money can be found for war, so it can be found for employment of the people, to finance production, to develop industries and public works. In the development of overseas trade, the guarantee of prices and markets for primary products, in adding 10 million pounds a year to Australia's war check, in giving Australia a major place among the nations of the world, J.P. Chipley, here seen with President Truman, and such men as Dr. Everett and J.A. Beasley have made history for this country. Today, after five years of Labour government, Australia is in a happier position than almost any other nation. Chipley's great objectives for the Australian people are these, freedom from want, freedom from fear of unemployment, sickness and old age. Today, Australia has social services unexcelled in any other part of the world. And so, as election day draws near, the election that follows in the wake of the storm, the eyes of Australia again look to Canberra, 
and in the minds of the people will echo these words of J.B. Chipley. So I will not give the paper any undertaking which cannot be fulfilled with that disaster and harm. I will take no risk without inflation or depression. And I will believe the distract responsibility is to the people and it believes that only labor can protect the interests of the people. Those are the words of a man who steered us out of the storm, whose calm assurance and wise caution will guide this country into security and prosperity. On Saturday, September the 28th, it will be for you to decide whether to exchange substance for shadow. For thinking Australians, there can be only one answer. Return the Chipley. That was in Newsville at the scene, the 19... Forty-six election. Over. So now we reached which he actually went through and won. Uh, so now we get to 1947, and I look. This looks at the lady, her gentleman, and the Governor General. On the 11th of March, 1947. William McKell became the second Australian appointed to the position of Governor General. An appointment reached only when Ben assured King George VI of William McKell's integrity and that the Crown would not be exposed to controversy. So during the 15 minute investiture ceremony of William McKell, Ben, uh, William McKell, Elizabeth, Seen here to the left of William McKell and Ben were both presented in the Senate chamber. Elizabeth is seated to the left. It's widely believed that Elizabeth didn't take part in the political side of Ben's life. This is one of the few times where she represented not only Ben and Bathurst and herself on the political stage. During Elizabeth's time in Canberra, her and Ben resided at the Prime Minister's Lodge, where Elizabeth hosted functions and made marking the investiture of William McKell as Governor General. Elizabeth would also then visit in October that year, where she arranged a number of luncheons and teas at the Lodge. And this is a picture. picture. So this is from 1947, and Elizabeth and Ben at the lodge. Elizabeth described the Prime Minister's lodge as an elegant house, one which she found pleasure in and in the gardens and enjoyed being there. During her during the time of the at the Prime Minister's lodge, Elizabeth was always accompanied by somebody, either Miss Ella Isabel Clark, close friends, and nieces and nephews. So this is another picture of Elizabeth with Mrs. Burke, Elizabeth's cousin. Elizabeth, Mrs. Penny Pinko, she was a housekeeper and kept it running like clockwork, and Mrs. Mrs. Clark. Now, they, there's two sets of photos that were taken in 1970, 1947 of Elizabeth at the Lodge. This one is during the investiture. The second set that is around is the October ones. So now we move on to some events in 1948. It's the author's and actresses. Ben was an avid reader. Detective novels and whodunits were favourites. He would sit with a book in front of the fire, lean back in his chair, with the book in one hand and the pipe in the other, trying not to scorch the pages. One of my most treasured possessions is that of a book of Ben's. And believe it or not, it is the complete works of William Shakespeare. Helen Keller, the American authoress and advocate for the deaf and blind visited, in, visited Australia in 1948 as part of a worldwide lecture tour. 
Arriving at Kingsford Smith on the 29th of March, Helen Keller and her companion, Miss Polly Thompson, commenced the tour as representatives of the American Foundation for the Overseas Blind. On the 21st of April, Helen and her companion, Miss Polly Thompson, had tea with Ben. And it is from this meeting, Miss Helen Keller coined the phrase, describing Ben as the Abraham Lincoln of Australia. And it's from there that this began to emerge in reports and comparisons. Miss Helen Keller is descri describes Ben as Mr. Chipley having a face of an, of an Abraham Lincoln and a very lovable character. By all account, accounts, this did not impress Sir Robert Menzies. <laughs> I am now going to play an extract from a letter. June the 11th was written, 1948. Ever since I met you in Canada, I have retained a most gracious memory of the warm reception you gave me. The quality about you reminiscent of Abraham Lincoln and your evident sympathy with those who toil and are heavily laden. It is this thought which emboldens me to write to you now. Helen Keller. In contrast, the American ambassador to Australia, Mr. Robert Butler, on his return back to the United States, is quoted as saying he found Southern Ben Chipley to set in his ways. In 1948, Sir Lawrence and Lady Olivia Vivian Lee, with the old big company, arrived in Australia six, for a six-month promotional tour of Australia and New Zealand. On Sunday the 25th, Sir Lawrence Olivier and Lady Olivier attended the Anzac Day ceremony in Australia at the Australian War Memorial. In his attendance were His Excellency, Mr. McKell and Mrs. McKell, and then And this is the silent footage of that event. The lady in the large hat and fur coat, that's Vivian Lee. That one there is, uh, yeah, that one's there. That's Vivian Lee there. And this shows the differing people that Ben was dealing with at the time. And it's also interesting because this isn't long after the War Memorial was opened. Then, Vivian Lee, he seemed to, Ben was also very much an avid theatre goer and movie goer. But unfortunately, no sound has ever recorded of this. And that's the end of day marches in 1948. I have not been able to find why Vivian Lee and Sir Lawrence Olivier were at the War Memorial at that, on that particular day for Anzac Day. And that is uh, William McCall and Mrs McCall.
So again, in July the 14th, 1948, Ben was staying at the Savoy. And he travelled there, he travelled to London for the British Leaders' Conference. At this time, Ben, when, when Ben was visiting London, at the Savoy, there was Alfred Hitchcock. Now, he was actually filming an adaptation of Under Capricornia, which is an Australian novel by Helen Anderson. And the leading lady was Ingrid Bergen. And they were all staying at the Savoy at the one, one time. When Ben was chatting with Alfred Hitchcock and Ingrid Bergman, Ben's press secretary, Don Rogers, and Jean Nicol, the publicity girl at the Savoy, were hatching a plan for a photograph. And it wasn't with Alfred Hitchcock. Jean asked Ben to pose with Ingrid Bergman, and the famous photo was taken. Jean considered this photo one of her greatest achievements. And it's one of my favourite photos of him. So now we come to 1949 and a quote from my grandmother. He always tried to do the right thing. Now, I'm starting this with another letter written by Bertie in 1949, in May, when the turmoil of the government was starting, and it describes the time at the Parliament and with her uncle. Hi, Bertie. one week before Ben would leave for the ALP conference at the Sydney Trains Hall, where on the 12th of June 1949, the Light on the Hill speech was given. Arguably one of the most important political speeches in Australian politics and the Labor movement. There is no recording of Ben giving this speech on the 12th of June 1949, only the words. Yet the speech goes to the ideals that reflects Ben, who Ben was, a statesman. Now, I thought about what I should do with the Life on the Hill speech. It's six stanzas long, so I'm, and I don't think a lot of people have ever heard 
his life on the hill stage. So I'm going to read the last three stanzas, which are his most poignant stanzas in that speech. I try to think of the Labour movement, not as putting an extra sixpence in someone's pocket, or making somebody Prime Minister or Premier, but as a movement bringing something better to the people, better standards of living, greater happiness to the masses of the people. We have a great objective, the light on the hill, which we aim to reach by working the betterment of mankind, not only here, but anywhere we may give a helping hand. If it was not for that, the labour movement would not be worth fighting for. If the movement can bring more comfortable, give some father or mother a greater feeling of security for their children, a feeling that if a depression comes, there will be work. That the, move, that the government is striving its hardest to do its best, then the labour movement will be completely justified. It does not matter about persons like me who have our limitations. I only hope that the generosity, kindness and friendliness shown to me by thousands of my colleagues in the labour movement will continue to give the movement and zest to its work. And they were the last three standards of the light on the hill stage. History records that on the 10th of December 1949, the Chifley Labor government was defeated at the polls by the Liberal Country Party coalition led by Sir Robert Menzies. In the wake of the coal strike, the defeat of the nationalisation of the banks and the mistrust of the trade union movement, Ben knew the election was going to be an uphill battle. Ben retained the, leader, the leadership of the Labor Party and in opposition, he promised to do the job in no half-blooded way. He gave all of himself, it, all of himself in as a national leader and gave the same as a committed opponent. In 1980, a five-year-old granddaughter came to visit her grandmother, Bertie, wearing her South Bathurst school uniform. Pinned to her shirt is a red ribbon with the word chipley printed on it, her sporting house. That five-year-old granddaughter was me. My grandmother asked, do you know who Chifley is? I had no idea. I was proud of my red ribbon. My grandmother pointed to this photo and said, this is your great-grandfather. He is a Chifley. This is my uncle. He is a Chifley. I looked up, to, up at my grandmother when she said, I am a Chifley and you are a Chifley. From that point on, my grandmother had the captive audience, someone to tell the stories of an uncle with an extraordinary job. I had an evening with a local statesman, Uncle Ben, for 15 years. A gift I am now only appreciating and has allowed me to share the stories I know so well tonight. Thank you.